Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Ulladu Narpadu. And today we're going to again talk about the sheaths, uh, like we did back in the last series, and how they make the world. If we scrutinize, the body is a form composed of five sheaths, panchakosha. Therefore, any or all of the five sheaths may be denoted by the term body. Without the body, that is, in the absence of the five sheaths, does any world, subtle or gross, exist? Is there anyone, having given up identifying the body as I, in sleep, death, or self-realization, who has seen the world? So this is a deep truth which we have to understand before we can actually understand the position of someone like Ramana who has attained self-realization. Because he's going to say a lot of things that don't make sense to us. Without the body, there is no world. What does that mean? For all practical purposes, the body is the world. And indeed, when we perceive the world, we do so through the senses of the body, subtle or gross. For example, in dreams, we're in the mental body. So we perceive a world which is made up by our ideas, our feelings, our memories, our fears, our desires, and so on. And this world is even populated with other beings, apparently. Yet, we know we're just there sleeping, right? There's nobody else around. So, where do all these people come from? Where does this whole world come from? The sheath, the mental body. So, I should digress for a moment for those who haven't seen our previous series on Upadesha Undiyar. The five sheaths are the Anamaya Kosha, the sheath of food. That's the meat body, <laughs> the one you can see. Ana means food, or specifically it means grains. Maya is a state of being or existence, and kosha, of course, is sheath. A coat, actually, literally coat. So we're wearing this coat of food. <laughs> And then beyond that, there's the pranamaya kosha. The pranamaya kosha is the energy body. Some people call it the etheric body or the astral body. Or it's not real clear what they mean by that. But anyway, prana or chi or ki is vital energy, life energy. And uh, according to our state of being, we have more or less control over it. Uh, those who are advanced and specifically who know arts like yoga, tai chi, qigong, can uh, exert a remarkable amount of control over their qi, their prana. I remember my qigong teacher was a little old Chinese lady. And uh, when I met her, she was 83 years old. And honestly, she could floor a room full of young, strong guys in about 10 seconds. I've seen her do it. So she didn't, she didn't even have to touch them. She did it all with energy. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, Darth Vader using the force, you know, bang, <laughs> you know. And then at 85 years of age, she broke her hip, slipped on the ice in San Francisco. She'd never been in a snowstorm in her life. So she fell on the steps of her house and broke her hip. Now, most people at that age will require hip replacement surgery or, you know, extensive physiotherapy or lots of treatment by doctors, you know. She said, no, 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 leave me alone. 
and she just went and gave her uh, hip a lot of chi treatments, flowing the energy through the affected area. And within a few weeks, she was walking again. And by six months later, she was fine. <laughs> 85, 86 years old. So chi uh, is life energy. And then there's the manomaya kosha, the mental sheath. And the mind, of course, and thinking and memory and all of that are functions of the manomaya kosha. Then we have the vijnana maya kosha is the sheath of intellectual and reasoning faculties. So beyond ordinary thinking, which is basically associative, driven by uh, similarities in emotions and perceptions, this sheath is more driven by logic. And of course, we address that through our study of ontology, which is the highest form of logic based on being. And of course, if you look at our earlier series, we go deeply into ontology because as long as you are stuck with a mind, it's really <laughs> the most powerful way to understand thinking. Now we're on a higher platform. But anyway, the next sheath is the Ananda Maya Kosha. Now, Ananda means bliss. And the Ananda Maya Kosha, even though it's called Ananda or bliss, is actually made of pure ignorance. <laughs> In deep sleep, we drop the other four koshas, and we're only in the Ananda Mai Kosha. And this is the sheath that restores us, heals us, that makes us uh, fit and strong and able to go out into life again and deal with all the problems and sufferings that we have to experience in life. That's why people need sleep. It's to heal from life, to heal from being involved with the other four koshas. <laughs> so each of these koshas, each of these sheaths, gives a particular set of uh, perceptions. And because of these perceptions, we see the world as it is. And of course, if something changes, in one of these sheaths, then the world that we see is going to change too. For example, we have in sleep, in dreaming sleep, we have the Ananda Maya Kosha and the Manomaya Kosha. So the Manomaya Kosha is the one that generates all these dreams and worlds and characters and so on that populate our dreams. That's why I wanted to interrupt that explanation <laughs> to introduce these different sheaths. So now, with these five sheaths, we perceive a world. And the world we perceive is the combination of these five, or however many we are engaged with at any given time. So during deep sleep, it's only the Ananda Maya Kosha. During dreams, it's that plus the Manomaya Kosha. And then in waking, all five Koshas. So the world that we see is dependent on the quality of these Koshas. This is the difference between heaven and hell. Uh, that people who have no Anamaya Kosha, no gross body, can have a subtle body in which they can go either to a heavenly place, a heavenly world, or a hellish world. Now, they may be present in the same physical space, but we would never know they're there, because we can only see things through the anamaya kosha, the gross senses. So anyone who's limited only to the gross senses won't see these other worlds that are possible. Now. Is it any benefit to try to attain these worlds? Not really. Not really, because we are still bound by the other sheaths. And because those lifetimes also have a beginning, 
they will have an end. So there's really no escape from the necessity for self-realization in any world, even by going to the highest heaven, even by becoming a demigod like Brahma. Huh? Brahma is born, so he also has to die. The only real escape from the inevitability of our disintegration uh, is self-realization. Now, in the case of a self-realized person, they do not perceive the world. Well, you might say, well, what about someone like Ramana, who is apparently aware of events and things around him, and who can answer questions and write books and do all kinds of things like that, isn't he aware of the world? And the answer is no. He is only aware of the self, Brahman. I suppose you could say it's sort of like seeing a balloon from the outside or seeing it from the inside. Actually, everything is Brahman including you and me, and, and we have always been Brahman. It's not that we become Brahman at the moment of self-realization. We're always Brahman, past, present, and future. So once we realize ourselves, we realize that everything is Brahman. Therefore, everything is the self. There's no difference, you see? Just because by nature there is some uh, superimposition on Brahman of these different worlds, these different koshas or sheaths, doesn't mean that we cease to be Brahman. We're still Brahman. Just there's this additional shell. Huh? So from the outside of the balloon, we may see, you know, some pattern or design. Huh? And from the inside of the balloon, we're going to see the same design, but from the inside. It's a very crude example. I can't really come up with a better one right this second. It means that the person who is self-realized, who is not identified with any of these sheaths, sees, so to speak, the same reality that we do, but sees it in a different way. He sees that everything is consciousness. Let me get, here's a good example. In 1984, I had spent over six months uh, with Rajneesh in Oregon. And then I got into a, a dust up with some of the mucky mucks in authority positions there and got kicked out. <laughs> See, Osho had given me a uh, very, very unique position where I had nothing to do. I stayed in a, a nice uh, quarters way out in the desert, far away from everything and everybody. And I had no work to do or anything. I was just to meditate. Well, of course, some people didn't like this and they became jealous. And make a long story short, they booted me out. Best thing ever had happened to me <laughs> because I went home to Portland and I meditated like crazy for six weeks and I attained the same enlightenment experience that Osho describes. Now, ever since, well, first I should say, what did I see? I saw that everything is Brahman. Everything. Down to the stones and dirt and trees and grass and everything. Everything is conscious to some degree in a different way. So this Brahman is the root substance or the substrate of all reality. And ever since then, I have seen like that, even though the experience itself faded. Because, you know, who can live on that peak of energy and consciousness? It's very difficult. Very, uh, it puts a lot of strain on the body. And you have to get on with life. You know, you can't sit there and meditate forever. So still, having seen that, I always see things that way now. I don't see that I am I and you are you and never the twain shall meet. No, I see that 
I am this consciousness, Brahman, and you are this consciousness, Brahman. And so are the dogs sleeping outside. <laughs> I was, I'm very happy they didn't start any ruckus. And all other things and creatures are also Brahman. And this is what it means not to see the world. We don't see the world as world. We see the world as consciousness only. And that's the difference. Om Tatsat. Om Harihi Om.